It is imperative as we approach the subject of psychic phenomena, biblical and otherwise, that we understand what I mean when I say psychic phenomena where the Bible is concerned. What is psychic phenomena so far as the scripture is concerned? Well, let me first of all dismiss from your mind any idea that the Bible contains any of the psychic phenomena that the contemporary psychics are talking about. When I say psychic phenomena in relation to the Bible, I am talking about what the people who believe in psychic phenomena and who are dabbling in psychic phenomena attempt to get out of the Bible and try to use the Bible to prove that the Bible indeed sanctions penetration of psychic phenomena. Now, what is psychic phenomena? Let's get some definition of terms. Psychic simply comes from the Greek word suke, which refers to the soul. Phenomena refers, quite obviously, to experience, to the things which we can experience and see and have knowledge of and comprehend. We are talking about psychic experiences or experiences of the soul, things which appeal to the spiritual nature of man. Now, the people who are interested in psychic phenomena, the spiritists, the Rosicrucians, the occultists in general who are involved in astrology and in all of the various forms of occultism, always say that the Bible has a vast record of psychic phenomena. And then they proceed to give you illustrations of this. So what I've decided to do in studying this is to take their key illustrations, the ones that they all seem to agree upon, and study them in their context, Old Testament and New Testament, so we understand what we're talking about and what they're talking about. Then we compare this with what the Scripture says as a whole, and we come out with the answer to what they're talking about and how we may effectively communicate that answer to them. So take your Bibles and let's look at what the world of the occult says is psychic phenomena. I'm not talking about uh, uh, materialized spirits here in your living room or seances and crystal balls. I've chosen some contemporary illustrations of terms which the people who are involved in psychic phenomena always use. Let's take some of these terms, illustrate them, and then take the biblical perspective. First of all, there is what is called levitation. Now, what is levitation? That is the capacity of a solid object to defy the laws of gravity, to levitate from the earth, that is, to be removed from the earth itself with no visible means of support. I'm not talking about Harry Houdini. I'm not talking about illusion. I'm not talking about hypnotism. I am talking about a chair suddenly rising from the floor. I am talking about a table lighter for cigarettes suddenly floating off the table. I'm talking about individuals all holding hands and the table upon which, around which they are sitting suddenly rising and they not touching the table or anything around touching the table. I'm talking about a spiritistic seance in which under light that can be observed where you can see it, red light preferably, a group of individuals can experience trumpets which float in the air, balls which float in the air under test conditions where you can put your hand underneath them, test them for magnetic fields and everything else, and they defy all known scientific inquiry. I'm talking about levitation in the world of the occult. Now this, I want to immediately convey to you, does happen. It is not something that is cooked up by well-meaning theologians to frighten people back to the study of the Bible. It is something that's real, and the people who are involved in this type of phenomena experience it and other things all the time. It's old hat to them. Now, to us it isn't, but to them it is. Now, they choose levitation. They choose also what is known as apportation. That means the moving of a solid object from one room to another or even over long distances by no visible means. That's called apporting something. 
A-P-P-O-R-T-I-N-G, for those of you who are taking notes. You say, oh, you don't really believe that. You don't really think that there are people that have the power to move a solid object from one room to another? Absolutely. They've been photographed doing it. In fact, the Soviet Union is now conducting extensive parapsychological and ESP investigations simply because there are Russian psychics doing these things right now behind the Iron Curtain and they have no answer for them scientifically. They've got to find some answer because they don't believe in God and they don't believe publicly in a spirit world. So how are they going to account for these things? Got to have a scientific answer. And so the Russians have gone into parapsychology with a vengeance. And we're going to get into that tomorrow night. We get into ESP and parapsychology. Are porting things from one place to the other. Then there is a third category, which is very familiar. Materialization. That is, a spirit actually taking on a physical form. So that in a room where there are eight or nine people present, one of them a medical doctor, a spirit assumes a form and the doctor is able to check the form and ascertain that the form is solid. Even take the blood pressure, so-called, and the heartbeat. Now, don't ask me how it's done because I don't know. But we have the affidavits of unbelieving physicians who have been through the experience and it's been very unnerving for them. I can imagine it be unnerving for anybody. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near the place myself. But this is what is known as materialization. And it comes in another form known as ectoplasm where a medium sitting around a table with a group of individuals will exude from the mouth and the nose and uh, from the body a form or substance that will take the shape of a so-called departed loved one. And uh, this type of thing has been photographed. I have 14 plates in my own possession taken an unimpeachable authority under test conditions and the faces match the faces in the family albums of the people sitting at the seances. Now, I didn't go to the seances but we have the pictures taken there of the ectoplasmic materializations. Now, there are phony mediums, there are charlatans, and there are the real articles. The real articles can do this, and they do it under test conditions. Then there is what is known as dream interpretation, in which a person has a dream, and an individual who is psychic, so-called, interprets the dream, explains it, and then it happens. This happens quite regularly in the world of the occult. And people say, well, that's prophecy. No, it's not prophecy. Something quite different from prophecy. But it does happen. It is valid dream interpretation. And, of course, seance where there are actual appearances of supposed departed spirits. And finally, what is known as astral projection. When an individual in a state of consciousness leaves their physical body and is capable of traveling long distances, observing other people and recording what they said and were doing, return to the body and then confirm what they saw by writing letters to the person describing what took place, plus other interesting methods of confirmation, telephone calls, etc. This is called astral projection. And these are common terms used by the people who are involved in psychic phenomena. Now, in order to make this palatable to the Christian, in order to make it meaningful to the religious person, they attach it to a Bible verse. So what I want you to do is take the Bible and I'll show you how each one of these things is attached. And then we'll detach it theologically and biblically so we'll understand what's going on. First of all, the subject of levitation. One of the best illustrations 
the people who believe in psychic phenomena cite for this, is found in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verse 51. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with this passage, but a lot of people aren't, so let's look at it together. Luke, chapter 24, 51. Came to pass while he blessed them, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Jesus Christ ascended. How did he ascend? He levitated. What does it mean to ascend? To go up. He defied the laws of gravity. Therefore, Christ was the supreme medium. He had the capacity to levitate. Now, there is one medium who is very well known for the act of levitation. I chronicled one of his levitations. He did many. But the people who believe in psychic phenomena liken his levitation to Jesus Christ. And they li liken it not only in the reference which I just gave you, but also to one other, Christ walking upon the water, Matthew 14, 25. If you check that reference, you'll find that the disciples were in the boat. Jesus came to them, what? Walking on the water. Well, they say, everybody knows you can't walk on the water. Actually, Jesus came to them and he was walking over the water. And he commanded Peter to come out and Peter came out towards him. And then you realize what happened. Peter lost his faith. He broke the psychic contact with Jesus. And what happened? He couldn't levitate anymore and he did what? Started to sink down into the water. Now this is a classic illustration of what is called Biblical psychic phenomena. These two instances. These are cited, I think, in perhaps a hundred books on the subject. What I've done is go through all the books and pick out the best ones that they all agree on. So we'll understand what's being done. And we'll have a clear perception of it. Uh, one of these great psychics who duplicated, they say, what Jesus Christ did was Daniel D. Holm. I want to read you briefly what happened in the presence of a number of witnesses when Daniel Holm, a famous medium, duplicated levitation in the context of the Bible. He was a young man of Scottish-American descent, lived in the British Isles, and he was capable, according to the record, of remarkable feats of contact. He was observed by Sir William Crookes, the famed British scientist and acknowledged authority, on the phenomena of, phenomena of spiritualism. And he stated, quote, There was definitely the operation of some agency unknown to science. Close quote. In the presence of Sir William Crookes and others, Daniel Holm caused wood blocks to rise from the table in front of everybody. Hands were placed underneath the wooden blocks. A pencil on the table stood up on its point and began to try and write all under the observing eye of everybody. And then, in order to demonstrate his most famous conquest of gravity, in 1868, this is your test condition, 5 Buckingham Gate, London, in the presence of Lord Lindsay and Adair, Captain Wynne and Captain Wynne, Daniel Holm, floated out of one window and into another. The windows were 76 inches apart, 85 feet above the ground, and there was no ledge or foothold between them. Close quote. What happened? He sat in a chair, rose from the chair, and floated through an open window in full view of three witnesses, out around the exterior, 85 feet from the ground, and then floated in the other window and settled back in the chair. Somebody says, things like that don't happen. You're right. Things like that don't happen under normal conditions. But Daniel Holm was not a normal man. He was an occultic medium, and he was deriving his energy from another source. Every time a medium succeeds in levitation, 
They say, you see, we are only doing what Jesus did. So look at what Jesus did, look at what we are doing, and you will see that we are perfectly in line with psychic phenomena as it's found in the Bible. Let's go a little bit further into some more of the material that they use. In Acts chapter 8, verse 39, an interesting thing takes place. I wonder if many Christians ever stopped and thought of it this way. Everybody knows that Philip had a discussion with the Ethiopian eunuch and then baptized him. I recognize as a Baptist in a Quaker church, it is not kosher to discuss the subject of baptism. And so we will not take time to go into any great detail on the subject of the baptism. All we'll point out is that this Ethiopian eunuch had the gospel preached to him and asked to be baptized, and he was. And then the record says, verse 39, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. So the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Verse 40, the Greek is very good here, but Philip was found at Azos. Now, take a good look at that. Think about it for a second. The Spirit of the Lord caught up Philip. And the next thing Philip knew, he was preaching at Azotus. That is what the mediums refer to as a case of biblical apportation. He was moved from one location to another, a solid object over a considerable distance. And they say, we do exactly the same thing today. And there are numerous recorded cases of individuals. J. Stafford Wright in Man, Mind, and the Spirits and others, those who have explored the psychic world and have done extensive case histories on this, I believe right now in the Library of Christian Research Institute that our files indicate that the combined number of such instances from the British Psychical Society and the American Psychical Society probably exceeds three or four hundred. And that is supposedly eyewitness verifications. Now, I'm not always ready to accept eyewitness verifications from some sources, but when they're meticulously gathered from different parts of the world, very strange that a mystic can be standing on a railroad platform in India in a crowd of his followers and suddenly disappear and reappear a couple of hundred miles away at another railroad station and there's been no train. You say, you don't think that really happened. Yeah, I really do think that happened. Primarily because more than 50 people testified to the man standing there, and then they had a telegraph message from him upon his arrival at the other station, all neatly cataloged with witnesses at the other station. You have to explain a couple of hundred miles distance and two groups of people, all of whom can't be lying. That's just not a conjecture, that's a fact. One great psychic has pointed out that apportation is really quite simple. All it requires is a tremendous concentration of psychic forces. Arthur Ford, who worked with James Pike and who was responsible for James Pike contacting his son who had committed suicide, spoke of numerous instances that occurred with Pike, and Pike himself wrote about these, of objects moving in plain sight from one portion of his apartment to the other, and of the hands of a clock in plain view moving from one hour around to another and the chimes ringing. It's very difficult to, at a, in a place like this to simply gainsay the evidence and claim that it did not occur. What we have to do is to look at it from the biblical perspective. Is Acts 8.39 a case of apportation? When Jesus walked on the water, was it really levitation? When he ascended, was it really levitation? These are the questions that have to be answered. We'll answer them, but let's look at two more. Materialization. Does the Bible have anything about materialization? Of course, 
said the psychic phenomenon. The Bible is filled with it. Luke chapter 1, verse 11. You recall there that John's birth was prophesied. By whom? Why, by a manifestation from the psychic world. An angel appeared. What does the word angel mean in Greek? Messenger. A messenger appeared from the psychic world, and John the Baptist, was to come into the world as a result of that proclamation. And he did. Biblical psychic phenomena, we are told. The birth of Jesus Christ, Luke 1, verse 28. Mary again communicated with, by what? A messenger, a psychic messenger. Well, how did she recognize him? How did um, Zacharias recognize this? Apparition. Was it an apparition? No. A man. A man standing at the altar. Gabriel, who stood in the presence of God. Well, the psychic phenomena people turn to you and say, there's an angel doing what? Taking a human form. Now, how are we going to answer this? When Abraham encountered three men on the plains of Mamre, the scripture says two of these men went down to Sodom. Is that not correct? And the city was destroyed. Two messengers. Who were they? But psychic manifestations. Materializations. In human form. And finally, what about the interpretation of dreams and astral projection? Well, Saul and Samuel is a classic case of the seance. When I was here last time and went through this material, we studied very carefully 1 Samuel chapter 28 to see that the only seance ever recorded in the Bible ended in disaster. The scripture tells us seances are forbidden by God. But the people who practice psychic phenomena say here is a bona fide seance in the Bible. And we have to recognize that here was psychic phenomena, supposedly. Another world entering into ours. But the one which is pointed to most frequently is that for astral projection. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 to 4. Now check this reference in your Bible because I'm sure it will come as quite a shock to you. This is astral projection. The Apostle Paul said, I knew a man about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. And then he goes on to describe whether in the body or out of the body, he's not sure. This is cited as an astral projection. And as proof positive that what we hear from the world of psychic phenomena is to be believed as a demonstration of God's power. Now, please notice what I said. The people who talk in the world of psychic phenomena, this is tremendously important, always make the claim that this power is from God. God is giving the materializations. God is apporting things. God is providing the energy for levitation. God gives the dreams and the interpretations. And God is behind the astral projection and the seances. This is what the world of the occult is doing today, and the Christian must recognize it. Seizing our Bible and using our Bible as supposed proof that all the things that are going on in the world of psychic phenomena really originated with God. This is what's being passed off to the public, and to the Christian public particularly. Now, how is it possible for us to come to grips with it and to answer it? All right? Let's look at the cases and the context and the biblical answer to it. What is the purpose of psychic phenomena? What is the purpose of all the phenomena that is being manifested? From Moses and the magicians of Egypt who duplicated the miracles of God all the way up to Antichrist who is going to duplicate the miracles of the Lord Jesus. What is the purpose behind the whole thing? The scripture tells us that the purpose of all imitation, the purpose of all imitation is deception. So people who are becoming involved in psychic phenomena must understand that the purpose of it all is to deceive. 
not to lead toward God, but away from Him. Now, how is it accomplished? All right, let's look at levitation. Daniel Holm levitated. Spiritistic mediums levitate. Jesus Christ ascended. What's the difference? Very great difference. First of all, Jesus Christ ascended into heaven as the Son of God. He did not levitate off the earth for the purpose of demonstrating psychic phenomena. He said, I ascend to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. He entered into heaven as our great high priest, Hebrews chapter 4. He did not levitate. He ascended from one dimension to the other. That's why we read in Luke chapter 24 that he ascended through the heavenlies. That's very important. When you levitate, you go up off the earth. But when you ascend, you go up and through. This is what the Lord Jesus did. Daniel Holm went up and around and through the window and down. He did not go into another dimension. Jesus Christ did. And the scripture says that an angel received him, that a cloud received him out of their sight. And the two young men stood there in white raiment, testifying to what? His levitation? No, to his second coming. Now, there's a vast difference between levitation and ascension. So make this note. Levitation and ascension are two different things. To levitate is to go up off the earth. To ascend is to go through to another dimension. That's exactly what our Lord did. He went through the heavenlies to the throne of God. Now, on the subject of apparitions, I don't even have to discuss Christ walking on the water because I think all of you have recognized immediately in reading the text that Jesus was walking on the water. The Greek preposition is on, on the waters. He was not up off the water. The preposition is on the water. So therefore, the argument that Jesus was over the top of the waves levitating, and that's what Peter did when he stepped out of the boat, is destroyed by the preposition. He was standing on the water. Somebody says, but water won't support your weight. It won't support yours, and it won't support mine. But it will support the weight of him who created it. And Colossians 1 says, by him were all things created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. All things were created by him, and for him he exists before all things. In him everything holds together. That includes H2O. Jesus walked on water. That's not levitation. Tremendously important point. As far as Philip being apported from one place to the other, please let me make this important observation. It's very strange that the words levitation, apporting, materialization, dream interpretation, seance, and astral projection are all comparatively new. All of these things, with the exception of dream interpretation, come after the Christian era. Very interesting. In other words, we are being asked to believe that the Bible is proving occultic psychic phenomena, when in reality the Bible is giving us true miraculous phenomena, and what comes after it is only a very cheap imitation. Ask yourself the question, which came first? The revelation of God came first, and then somebody started to do what? Imitate. That's an awfully important point to remember when studying these things. Now let's go a step further, particularly on, this, on the subject of astral projection. In astral projection, we're told that the Apostle Paul left his body, and that he went to heaven and came back again. But well, let's deal with astral projection for a second. What is it? You're supposed to have a light body or an astral body. This body is capable of leaving your body and of going elsewhere and of reporting phenomena back again. Are there actual cases of astral projection, so-called? Yes. In fact, there's a man here tonight who's experienced astral projection when he was a member of an occultic group. 
and he could testify to you that it does occur. The big question is, what is it? And how is it accomplished? Do you really leave your body or are there forces working which create the illusion that you have left your body and give you supernaturally information? In dealing with the subject of astral projection, you're always dealing with the spiritists, you're always dealing with the theosophists, you're always dealing with the people who are citing this as proof that you survive death and that the astral body goes on as a type of envelope onto the next plane of reality. Let me point this out to you. What are the people who are interested in psychic phenomena looking for? They are looking for the conquest of death. And they are looking for power in their lives right now. Now please notice that I began by saying the purpose of psychic phenomena is imitation to deceive. And it is very clear, crystal clear, that those who are practicing this are reaching out for some type of spiritual reality in order to conquer death. There are Christians who say, believing in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord gives us the power to face death without fear. I want to tell you something. A good spiritist faces death without fear too. Yes. And a lot of people who are into this psychic phenomena where they have seen reality in another dimension, they face death without fear. Why? Because they believe they don't die. They go on one step higher to the next plane and the next plane in infinite progression. Coupled with reincarnation, it is most comforting because you do not have to face judgment and hell. You see, what we're really facing, ask yourself the question, which came first? The revelation of God came first and then somebody started to do what? Imitate. That's an awfully important point to remember when studying these things. Now let's go a step further, particularly on, this, on the subject of astral projection. In astral projection, we're told that the Apostle Paul left his body and that he went to heaven and came back again. Well, let's deal with astral projection for a second. What is it? You're supposed to have a light body or an astral body. This body is capable of leaving your body and of going elsewhere and of reporting phenomena back again. Are there actual cases of astral projection, so-called? Yes. In fact, there's a man here tonight who's experienced astral projection when he was a member of an occultic group. And he could testify to you that it does occur. The big question is, what is it? And how is it accomplished? Do you really leave your body or are there forces working which create the illusion that you have left your body and give you supernaturally information? In dealing with the subject of astral projection, you're always dealing with the spiritists, you're always dealing with the theosophists, you're always dealing with the people who are citing this as proof that you survive death and that the astral body goes on as a type of envelope onto the next plane of reality. Let me point this out to you. What are the people who are interested in psychic phenomena looking for? They are looking for the conquest of death. And they are looking for power in their lives right now. Now please notice that I began by saying the purpose of psychic phenomena is imitation to deceive. And it is very clear, crystal clear, that those who are practicing this are reaching out for some type of spiritual reality in order to conquer death. There are Christians who say, believing in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord gives us the power to face death without fear. I want to tell you something. A good spiritist faces death without fear too. Yes. And a lot of people who are into this psychic phenomena where they have seen reality in another dimension... They face death without fear. Why? Because they believe they don't die. They go on one step higher to the next plane and the next plane in infinite progression. Coupled with reincarnation, it is most comforting because you do not have to face judgment and hell. 
You see, what we're really facing as Christians right now is psychic phenomena as a substitute for faith. People who have abandoned faith in the God of the Bible and the salvation of the gospel and the Lord Jesus are turning to psychic phenomena and manifestations for what purpose? For the purpose of the conquest of fear and of death and of obtaining power here so that they can live. What the Christian obtains as a gift from God through the power of the Holy Spirit Men who dabble in psychic phenomena and women and young people are seeking to obtain by satanic means. Because God is not in the least interested in any of the things we have been talking about. God doesn't levitate. God does not apport. Philip was not apported. Philip was removed from Gaza to Azotus by the Spirit of the Lord and placed there for the purpose of preaching the gospel. That is not the same as a spiritistic medium or somebody in psychic phenomena turning around and saying, well, so-and-so was moved from this railroad platform to another. So it's apportation. What was the purpose of going from one railroad platform to the other? Did anybody's life get changed? Was there redemption preached? Was that transformation? The answer is no. What was it done for? For the purpose of demonstrating another dimension of reality to get people to put their faith in it. Isn't it significant? Turn to this for a moment. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, that God says to the Jews that they are to beware of this very type of thing. They're to beware of people who have extraordinary powers because they are going to use those powers in a unique way, contrary to what God has said. Look for a second at it. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and gives you a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder comes to pass whereof he spoke unto you, saying, let us go after other gods. Notice this. Verse 2. Signs and wonders. Well, I want to tell you something. Psychic phenomena is certainly a sign and a wonder. And anybody that's ever experienced it knows it is. God says if anybody shows you a sign or a wonder and it comes to pass, what's the next thing that he's going to do? Look at the text. He says, let us worship other gods whom you have not known. I make this statement fully cognizant that there are people in the world of psychic phenomena who will disagree with me. I'm willing to match up quotations and documentation uh, galore if they want to. But I think it can be proven beyond a question of a doubt that the people who are engaged in the study of psychic phenomena and involved in all of these occultic mazes are individuals who always end up worshipping someone other than the God of the Bible and accepting someone other than Jesus Christ as the Savior of lost souls. In other words, what does the psychic phenomena lead to? It leads away from the cross and into darkness. Now, it's very easy to say, this is all a work of the devil, therefore, we shouldn't be concerned about it. It is a work of the devil. And if you're not concerned about that, at the end of the ages when the scripture says we are to anticipate the outgrowth of great spiritual darkness, what in the world is wrong with the church? If we can sit still in the middle of a whole generation given over to the pursuit of psychic phenomena, which is attempting to take over the word of God and use its terms to describe satanic phenomena, and we do nothing about it except say, it's of the devil, let's not bother with it. What are we bequeathing to the children? And what are we bequeathing to the church? Someone simply has to say, here be God and here be Satan. And there has to be a clear delineation. Well, here it is. Clear so that none can miss it. Why is psychic phenomena so attractive to so many people? Because it's unknown and it's exciting and because it's mysterious and because it displays power. You ought to note those things. 
because they're real and they have meaning. It attracts people because it's unknown to them and whatever is unknown to you automatically attracts you. It's mysterious and people love an air of mystery. I have a friend whose wife likes to listen to late night radio programs. And one of these late night radio programs they had an occultist on who was describing astral projection and leaving your body. And she said she was lying there in bed thinking about what he was saying. And suddenly, though she is a Christian, she began to get the weirdest feelings and the weirdest impulses. She wanted to leave her body. She wanted to do this projection travel. She wanted to see these things. And all of a sudden, a voice within her spoke to her and told her just as clearly as she could ever have wished it. This is not of God. And the moment she heeded that voice and prayed, Lord Jesus, deliver me from this, instantly it left her. She turned off the radio program. Christians are not immune to having their minds corrupted. The Bible says that you will not lose your soul. But the Bible says your mind can be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says you can be deceived and led astray. I have met Christians who have been led astray by psychic phenomena, who have been led astray by the kingdom of the cults and the occult. I've seen their messed up, confused, and frustrated lives because they started to dabble in the things that God says to leave alone. No, Jesus Christ walked on the water. He didn't levitate. Philip was not apported. There is no such thing as apportation in biblical theology. He was moved by the Spirit of God from one place to the other, which is a lot different than moving an ashtray from one room to another or appearing and disappearing in a railway station. And the Scripture indicates that when it comes to the interpretation of dreams, God has a corner on the market. If you really want to know what a dream means, then pray about it. I know some Christians raise their eyebrows when you say that. You mean I should pray about my dreams? Yeah, if you've got some bad ones. Pray about them if you have recurring dreams. Pray about anything that disturbs you. Because if you don't, it's going to go right on disturbing you. You don't have to go to a psychiatrist or a depth psychologist and you don't have to dabble in psychic phenomena to find out about your dreams. Genesis chapter 40 verse 8 says, Does not the interpretation of a dream belong to God? The answer is yes, it does. Now let's keep that thought in mind. He holds the key to all interpretation. In fact, the word interpret in Hebrew means to make something plain. You want something made plain to you? Seek from the Lord. Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah chapter 8. A good verse for you to remember. Isaiah chapter 8, 19. If you want some information about anything, ask God. You shouldn't inquire of the wizards. You shouldn't inquire of the mediums. Ask the Lord. If you want direct information, God is the one who's going to give it to you. And he's willing, up to a point, to give us that assurance. Now, we often hear, as I pointed out to you before, about materialization and the materialization of the angel Gabriel, and the materialization of the angel that wrestled with Jacob. You remember Jacob's wrestling? That was with a materialized spirit, we are told, in the world of psychic phenomena. But let me ask you a question. How many of you have read carefully the book of Daniel, where it speaks, uh, Daniel chapter 5, of Daniel's interpretation of the writing on the wall? Have you ever read that carefully? very interesting. Turn to it for a moment and look at it because it's a key to materialization because there was a materialization but quite different than the spiritists and the people who are involved in psychic phenomena. Daniel chapter 5 Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and they all got drunk. They all proceeded to blaspheme God. They all proceeded to do despot to his temple and to the things taken from the temple. 
Verse 5 says, In the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. He was very disturbed. I'd be very disturbed too if while I was speaking to you here, a man's hand from the wrist came up on the wall and proceeded to write there. It would disturb me. I hope it would disturb you too. It certainly disturbed Belshazzar. And so he asked for an interpretation. Who did he go to? He went to the magicians and he went to the astrologers and to the Chaldeans and to the soothsayers. Verse 11. And nobody could help him. So he finally went to Daniel. Verse 12 says, For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences. Who's the one that shows the meaning of hard sentences? God. And dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar. Let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. So Daniel comes and he shows the interpretation. Very direct interpretation. God has numbered your kingdom and he has finished it. You want a modern translation of that? You have had it. That is the end of your kingdom. It's divided and given to the Medes and the Persians and that night Belshazzar was murdered. And it happened exactly as God said. Now say the people who say the Bible teaches psychic phenomena, there's a spiritistic manifestation a materialization of a human hand from another dimension and obviously it had to be interpreted by Daniel who was a medium. That's the explanation. Let's look at the passage and see if it says that. Verse 11, after the soothsayers and the astrologers had failed, this is found. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. Daniel was not a medium. He was a prophet in whom dwelt the spirit of the living God. Daniel could interpret what was on the wall because the Holy Spirit lived in Daniel. Even the pagans recognized that. The materialization of a human hand writing on the wall was not conjured up by ectoplasm from a medium. So it is not an example of materialization. It was a direct act of God visually permitting them to see a human hand right on the wall. But it was not an ectoplasmic manifestation. So we do not have a parallel case. So when you're told this from the book of Daniel, remember it. Daniel was master of the mediums and the magicians. And Daniel was a man who was a prophet indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, our time seems to rush by because I've been speaking 50 minutes. And in time rushing by rapidly, we don't have much opportunity to finish all the things we would like to. But I will let, conclude with this important point. The purpose of psychic phenomena, as we have seen, is to imitate. The purpose of imitation, Deuteronomy 13, is deception and to lead us away from the Lord our God. Why are people attracted to psychic phenomena in our day or any day? One, it is unknown and exciting. Two, it is mysterious and appeals to our carnal nature. Three, it is a display of power outside of our capacity to control it. Four, it is a substitute for hearing the voice of God. And five, it is a spiritual narcotic. Now think about that for a second. A regular narcotic does what? It affects the brain and the central nervous system. And what effect does it have? It gives a feeling of well-being. It creates hallucinations and generally tends to remove the subject from reality. That is the product of a normal narcotic phenomena. 
That is precisely what happens in the realm of the spirit. The moment an individual accepts psychic phenomena and really believes it implicitly, it becomes a substitute for reality in the dimension of the spirit. It is a narcotic which anesthetizes man's spiritual nature, makes him insensitive to the reality of God so that he does not hear the voice of God. He hears other voices. And the hallucinations he has are not mental, they're spiritual. That's why he's able to believe that the Bible is talking about psychic phenomena when, as we have seen, the Bible is not talking about that. That's why he's able to believe that psychic phenomena is compatible with Holy Scripture when it is not. When you are under the influence of a narcotic, you are incapable of rational judgment. When you are under the influence of a spiritual narcotic, you are incapable of rational spiritual judgment. We see before us a whole generation of people overcome, overcome by a spiritual narcotic. Paul had no astral projection. He simply uses a figure of speech. He says, my experience with Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 12, was so fantastic, I can't tell you whether I was on earth or I was in heaven. But there's not a line there that says that Paul had an astral projection and went floating around in some other ethereal realm where he could observe mankind. That's all you get with an astral projection. But when you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, you can be lifted to the height of heights and you are lifted into fellowship with the living God. Now all around us today, there is lots of contemporary evidence for psychic phenomena. Sir Oliver Lodge and his spirit control, Raymond, who was allegedly his dead son, have given us a great deal of information on this other dimension. There are poltergeists all over the landscape. You know what a poltergeist is? A poltergeist is a familiar spirit. Now, if you want to know what a poltergeist does, you probably read it in your California newspapers at one time or another. A poltergeist causes a picture to fly off the wall, a table to tip over, some crockery to sail through the air. In one incident chronicled in a village in Brazil with 17,000 inhabitants, hundreds of whom witnessed this, including the police and the local priest, a poltergeist tore stones from the courtyard, the interior, and the roof of a prominent house in plain sight of everybody and threw them all over the landscape through people's windows at policemen through the windshield of cars in full view of hundreds of witnesses. Nobody has successfully explained to the Brazilian newspaper what was going on in that house because there was nobody in the house. Nobody on top of the house Nobody outside the house. All they saw were stones they had to keep ducking. That's a poltergeist. The poltergeist has unusual manifestations. They slam doors. They walk up steps. They turn clocks back. They are mischievous spirits. Not too long ago, I was checking a reference in John Wesley, and I found out that John Wesley's home where he lived with his parents, was inhabited by a poltergeist, by a mischievous spirit or a demon. And in Wesley's journal, he notes what the poltergeist did, such as moving furniture around and generally disturbing Mrs. Wesley and John and Charles. So even the great Methodist divine had his problem with the poltergeist. The psychic phenomena, people say, they are the memory imprints of people who have not yet found their peace. Hans Holzer says he thinks it's a personality. He's the ghost tracer or catcher. He thinks they're traces of human personality left behind. All I can say is some human personality was throwing an awful lot of rocks down in Brazil and nobody was able to find any traces. Poltergeists are well known and accepted. The phenomena 
is real. These are things that are about us on every side. Not to mention the one thing that the psychic phenomena advocates are always emphasizing. They are always emphasizing healing. And that's why in the world of psychic and occultic phenomena you will always find people going for healing. William Branham, who was very famous traveling through this country a few years ago, was preaching a variety of gospels and laying hands on people from one end of the country to the other, had some miraculous healings all carefully chronicled. When he was asked in an interview, who did the healing and was it the Holy Spirit? Branham said, no, my angel does it. He stands over on my right when the people come up to be prayed for. He was then asked to give a description of his angel. The angel was quite attractive, dark skinned, or at least a dark complexion, and with dark wavy hair. And the angel told him what to do and what to say and who to pray for and what to pray. Branham's writings began to reflect what was going on. He ended up by denying the doctrine of the Holy Trinity as well as many other Christian doctrines. He was killed in an automobile crash a few years ago. In England we have Harry Edwards who has been doing the same thing. And of course the Casey readings are well known. Yes, there is healing in the world of psychic phenomena. But it is not healing that comes from God. Let me close with this thought. Please do not think that the world of the psychic phenomena, of the poltergeist, the world of the materializing spirit, the world of the apportation, the world of levitation, the world of the seance and of astral projection is a pipe dream. These are real things going on in our world. And the only answer to it is the historic gospel of Jesus Christ. The only answer is the Word of God, and the only way to deal with it is from the perspective of Scripture. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And the Word of God tells us when we go out to meet the forces of darkness, put on the whole armor of God, and therefore stand. Don't run, don't panic, don't be frightened, therefore Ephesians 6, stand. Take the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and stand against it. And the world of psychic phenomena will melt in the face of the world of biblical revelation. May God add his blessing to his Word. Our Father, we ask thy blessing. Burn into our hearts the great challenge which is before us. Help us to see souls for whom Jesus Christ has died, lost and undone, because they have walked away into the domain of the prince of the powers of the air. Give to us a spirit of love and compassion and understanding, and power from thy Holy Spirit that we may reach out to them, and help us, our Father, to be protected from all these forces, that we may bear witness for thy Son Jesus, who loveth us, and hath loosed us from our sins in his own blood. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.